right now on five on your side at 10. Well, it's been a little bit more muggy the last couple of days, but these numbers start to go down over the next few days. Why that's important for the way it feels and for our overnight low. Tonight, the Ferguson police chief with a message of gratitude. Everybody has their fingers crossed. We're keeping them in our prayers. Just hoping that he, he comes out well. His message to the community one week after the violent protest that left Ferguson police officer Travis Brown in a coma. But first tonight, new transportation concerns at St. Louis Public Schools. Two days before the start of class, hundreds of students now in need of a way to get to school. To me, it's just part and parcel of a failing school district and a failing really board leadership. We want to thank you for joining us at 10. I'm Brent Solomon. It is the latest transportation setback for St. Louis Public Schools. Just hours ago, the district said one of its vendors can no longer provide buses for the first day of school. So five on your side contacted that company. New tonight, Annie Crawl joins us in studio. Annie, what's going on here? Brent, SLPS says extra care transportation told the district they cannot provide six buses by Monday. That would impact about 1,000 students at 23 SLPS schools. The founder of Extra Care tells me the buses are not canceled altogether, they're just delayed. That is not a denial, just a delay. We will not deny or we will not walk away from providing the school bus services to the families of St. Louis. However, uh, there are certain requirements that must be met when you utilize school buses within any school district, and we want to make sure that we are meeting those requirements. Johnson says her team is working on having those half a dozen delayed buses ready for SLPS by August 26th, a week after the first day of school. SLPS also announced today that two other providers have made adjustments to how many buses they are providing. The district says Shuttle Pro reduced the number of buses from 45 to 25, affecting as many as 1,800 students. Yesterday, impacted parents were given gas cards. A third vendor, Victorious Life International, told the district it could not acquire 10 buses to transport students. SLPS says it is working to ensure that parents are notified fight about an alternate plan. Earlier today, we spoke with the founder of Coalition for STL Kids. He says this continued transportation saga isn't even the biggest problem in the district. It's really inconvenient and problematic for parents when their children can't get to school, but that's like 30 minutes, right? What I would be focused on more is the eight hours that they're in the building, right? What's going on if only 13% if only of black kids can read on grade level? What's happening? We should mention the district alerted us about the transportation update this afternoon to be transparent about what exactly is happening. This week we've learned SLPS will provide before and after care at all elementary schools starting Monday. Brent. All right, Annie, we'll work to learn the latest. Thank you. We are keeping you up to date on this developing story on air and online as well as on a 5 plus app. Stay tuned for more. Tonight, an eviction notice from SLPS forcing several nonprofits from the Clay Community Center. They must clear the former Clay Elementary School by next week. Five on your side, Travis Cummings caught up with one organization that's scrambling to get out. It's really frustrating because North St. Louis definitely does not need another vacant building. This land has seen a lot of life. We've uh, hosted hundreds of young people here on the property doing field trips, um, service learning activities. We've uh, hosted our team program, the Sunflower Institute here. Now the community garden outside the Clay Community Center in North City is being dug up. Nick Speed's nonprofit, Ujima, is here to provide equitable access to food, education, and employment. We are in a position where St. Louis Public Schools is evicting us. Speed showed us this email he got from a professor at SLU. The university partners with the nonprofit and facilitates the property. The email says the district proposed a lease agreement to the university in late May that was just financially impossible for them. Uh, there was a conversation about raising the rent as well as having folks pay for the uh, water damage in the building and so uh, instead of coming back with a counter offer giving us an opportunity to come up with a new MOU and a plan they decided to just kick us out and so we've made several attempts to reach out to the district but they've gone radio silent. 
Volunteers came from near and far to help clear the lot on North 14th Street on Saturday. Putting in rows so people can plant food and flowers and then just suddenly being told you guys have a week to remove all this. Yeah, it's pretty heartbreaking. Even our teens are feeling feeling the feels. Um, they put a lot of hard work and effort into, you know, cultivating and building this. Speed, who owns another space down the road, says this won't stop him from sowing seed. We know the sense of urgency is great in places like North City, and so the, the work is going to continue. Travis Cummings, five on your side. And the SLLPS Board of Education vice president took to social media saying, quote, a private university that doles out millions of dollars in tax abatements demands free rent and refuses to pay for significant damage it caused to a public building. We reached out to Davis to elaborate. He referred us to the school district spokesperson. We're still awaiting for a response. Tonight, the St. Louis County prosecuting attorney taking more steps to vacate Marcellus Williams' murder conviction. Williams is facing the death penalty, convicted of killing a former Post-Dispatch reporter, Felicia Gale, back in 1998. Wesley Bell is trying to stop that execution by tossing out an affidavit from Gale's husband. Bell says it's speculation and should not be used as evidence. Williams' execution is set for September 24th. Tonight, an outpouring of support for Officer Travis Brown with Ferguson Police. Officer Brown remains in a coma after he was shoved to the ground. It happened at a protest marking 10 years since Michael Brown's death. A GoFundMe for the officer has raised more than $138,000. Ferguson Police Chief Troy Doyle joins us on the record tomorrow. He talks about what he's dealt with this past week. It's tough, you know, especially again, not only did the guy work for me, he was a personal friend of mine. He worked in St. Louis County when I was there. He worked for me then. He wanted to come work for me over in Ferguson. So you can only imagine, you know, the, um, the pain that I'm going through mm -hmm. in regards to this. You can hear much more of that interview tomorrow night on the record right after Sports Plus. Just hours ago, Sumner High School set the stage for a social event to curb violence. Every month, the Office of Violence Prevention in St. Louis hosts what they call kickback events to provide a safe space for people and to raise awareness of violence prevention and resources for intervention. City leaders hope these events will bring folks together. Because this is so important to see so many positive things that are happening in our city. And we got to make sure that we're showing all the positives and where this city has so much potential and already has so many great things. We have our challenges. We're going to be dealing with them. We acknowledge them. We have so many good things. Next month's OVP kickback happens on September 21st at Hickey Park in the Baden neighborhood. That's from 2 until 6 p.m. Well, area grocery stores are helping fight food insecurity in our area. Today, Operation Food Search held a shop out hunger day at area Straubs, Schnooks and Deerberg's locations. Shoppers could toss a few extra items into their carts and then pass those items along to volunteers who will give them to families in need. So non-perishable items, ideally things that are not in glass, um, so boxes, pouches, uh, items that, bags of, of, you know, whole grain products, things that, that are easily able to go back to Operation Food Search and then distributed. The food drive continues at Chinook stores through August 25th. We're tracking the tropics tonight as Ernesto leaves its mark on Bermuda. 26,000 customers without power around the island right now. How the Category 1 hurricane is impacting parts of the U.S. Political ads taking over your airwaves. But are you seeing one side more than the other? What the Verify team is uncovering tonight. We started off this morning in the mid 70s in the city, 60s outside of the city. Why over the next few days, some 10 to 15 degrees will be shaved off these numbers and when we can expect it. Tonight, Hurricane Ernesto is moving out of Bermuda after striking the island nation as a category one storm. While it won't make direct impact with the U.S., part of the eastern seaboard, filling Ernesto's effects. More than 18 million people are under alert, says high surf and dangerous rip currents hit the mainland from Florida to Maine. Two deaths are being blamed tonight. Even buildings along the North Carolina coast are in Ernesto's path. 
As the hurricane moves out of Bermuda, it leaves thousands without power. We've been here three years now, so we've been here for uh, Fiona two years ago. But this was probably more intense than Fiona. This has been really hard. This is hard for us in our daily lives and for those of us who have businesses. Gusts of wind up to 105 miles per hour hit Bermuda this morning. The island could experience more flash flooding through the weekend as Ernesto moves out. And while it's not going to have a direct impact on the United States like some of them do, we have this low that's still bringing us cloud cover. It's exiting tomorrow. Now what's behind it? Drier, cooler air. How long that lasts? We track that just ahead. With just two days to go before the Democratic National Convention, Chicago is preparing for more than just the delegates to arrive. Already, hundreds of protesters are making their voices heard near convention sites. It's prompted heightened security measures all around the city. Protesters now have designated rally areas, and local businesses are boarding up their windows just in case. The DNC runs from August 19th through the 22nd. Our political editor, Mark Maxwell, will be in Chicago for the DNC. Look for his reports every day on air, online, and streaming on the 5 Plus app. Well, this week, Donald Trump returned to Twitter, now known as X, during a live interview with Elon Musk. And that made some wonder whether Musk has to interview Kamala Harris due to the equal time rule. Verifies Casey Decker has that answer. It's election season, which means many of the ads you see during commercial breaks are now for political candidates. And sometimes you might see a lot more ads from one candidate than you see from their opponent. This raises a question a lot of people have during election season. Aren't candidates guaranteed equal amounts of ad time? Let's verify. Our sources are the FCC, the Communications Act of 1934, and David Schultz, a law professor at the University of Minnesota. The idea of equal time for candidates on TV comes from the Communications Act, which is enforced by the FCC. It says that if a candidate appears for more than four seconds on a TV station's air, that station, quote, shall afford equal opportunities to all other such candidates for that office. But there are some big exceptions. Notably, news coverage or interviews don't count. What does count is entertainment content. For example, when Dr. Oz ran for Senate, he stopped making his show, in part because any station that aired it would have had to offer equal free airtime to his opponent. But there's another key limitation of this law. Notice it says equal opportunities, not actually equal time. So if a candidate buys an ad for $1,000 in prime time, the station has to give their opponent the option to purchase an ad for the same price at the same time. But if the opponent doesn't want to buy that ad space, the station doesn't have to do anything else. It doesn't mean that it has to give, at the end of the day, the same amount of real time if some candidates have more money and could actually purchase more time. All it says is we've got to provide the same opportunity. And yet another limitation, this law only applies to broadcast TV and radio. So cable and the internet aren't affected by any of this. That means CNN, ESPN, Hulu, Facebook, none of them have to offer equal advertising opportunities. And Elon Musk doesn't have to give Kamala Harris a highly promoted interview on X just because he gave one to Donald Trump. That means we can verify no political candidates are not guaranteed equal amounts of ad time. With your Verify, I'm Casey Decker. As always, we welcome your Verify ideas. All you got to do is email verify at ksdk.com. Let's go ahead and get to your weather impact forecast now. Meteorologist Gary Frank joining us. and. He likes to call it a good forecast. Yeah, it's really nice. Uh, for <laughs> August standards, we can have hot, humid. Right. Uh, you know, we're in really good shape. Now, our temps in the upper 70s right now. We're trending. This is kind of a day that as we start to work our way into uh, maybe a better week, it was all right, but it was hot and humid at times. Uh, dew point at 66. We got to 90 today, pretty close to average from top to bottom. But right now, as we see our final days of summer, and it doesn't sound like it, but we're there, uh, we almost average 80 degrees so far, and that is June, July, and August. So far this summer in St. Louis, 25th warmest summer so far. So that's our weather impact fact. And then we, as we draw closer to meteorological fall in September 1st, 
that's a record purposes thing. Those days are always different as the Earth's position changes. So we'll just get to that. It's it's close. We're getting there, right? But we're going to start to feel like fall, and that's why we're kind of excited about it in terms of humidity levels because our humidity comes down Monday and Tuesday as a result of that northwesterly breeze and our pattern change. We'll start to feel that tonight with a few clouds around, but overall temps in the mid to upper 60s outside. It will not be 74 to start your day tomorrow morning. In some cases, low to mid 60s outside of the city. And tomorrow, as a result, with that northwest breeze, we're in the low 80s. It's excellent outside. A few clouds around, but still very nice. Like I mentioned, lower than average. Starting to feel more like fall, even despite this big heat dome off to our southwest. What that's going to do is kind of it won't strengthen quite as much. It'll shrink a little bit, but its impacts will be felt, if nothing else, as we're not so much on the edge of it anymore. We had those repeated chances for storms that materialized here and there. We're going to be on the edge of its heat, but still impacted by the sinking air that keeps our weather pattern pretty standard and sends all the major storm systems to the north. What that does for us pretty much the rest of the week, as we look toward Monday and Tuesday, we're still on the periphery of cooler than average readings, and then once that heat kind of works its way back in, settles over us, we'll be a little bit warmer. But what you'll notice is we're not much higher than average, and we had a couple of days lower than average. And that's why it's going to feel so nice over the next few days. Of course, until next Saturday, the heat builds throughout the entire upper Midwest. And then it gets hot here again. That's what we'll be talking about seven days from now. However, mid to even low 80s and low 60s. And I'm not one of those people that's ready to turn off the AC just yet. But even talking about fall, even the periphery of fall, these are the type of days that I think a lot of us like. We don't want to get into the cold stuff just yet. We want to be able to warm up and yeah. enjoy as we head toward Labor Day. But that's kind of a nice little happy I think day. I've already seen ads for pumpkin coming up. Oh, well, I've already <laughs> seen. I've seen products, and I am ready <laughs> to get going. I know yeah, what baby. to get you on the way to work. <laughs> Corey, what's going on, my friend? whole lot going on in St. Louis sports tonight. All over the place. Illinois side, Missouri side as well. We had a tense ending out at the track and a much-needed bounce back with Bush. Stick around. Sports is up after the break. This Five on Your Side Sports Report is sponsored by Telly Tire and Auto Centers, driving your way since 1942. The word of the weekend at Bush Stadium, urgency. The Cardinals want to make the playoffs. They need to make their move now. Game one against the mighty Dodgers didn't move things in the right direction, but tonight was a different story. If this guy is on the broadcast, it must be a good omen. Hey, Wayno, 1-1 one, one in the third, and here comes Burley. Alec Burleson crushes one out to right, two-run shot, his 21st of the season, 3-1 cards. But if you leave a ball right here to Shohei Otani, he's going to do that with it. Absolute rocket homer. The blue in the crowd loved it, 3-2 Cardinals. Mason Wynn went deep last night, and he did it again tonight. That is no cheapy either. Dead center and gone, 4-2 Cardinals. Andre Pallante was awesome on the mound. Seven innings, two runs, five strikeouts, and lots and lots of ground balls. Gets a double play there. Cardinals got some insurance thanks to Nolan Arenado in the eighth. Man, do they need him down the stretch. Look at that home run. That's out to left. 5-2 at that point. And then Ryan Helsley would come on to finish things off with an absolutely nasty final pitch to strike out Gavin Lux. Cardinals win 5-2 to end their five-game losing streak. I mean, we haven't lost our confidence. I mean, uh, we still believe we can. Um, obviously, Mason, Burley, they did a great job. They kind of carried us on the offense side, but uh, Wilson, too. Guys had some good at-bats, but like I said, it starts with pitching. If you give us a chance to score runs and uh, keep uh, that team, who was really good in the ball game, and uh, we'll be all right. It wasn't just baseball this weekend in St. Louis. It's IndyCar weekend at Worldwide Technology Raceway, and the racers put on a show once again under the lights in Illinois. Take a look at this and remember it. Lap 196, Joseph Newgarden spins out but doesn't take contact and saves himself. Like I said, remember that. It's important. Couple big wrecks in this one. 21 laps to go. David Mulakis into the wall. That car is done. And 10 laps to go. Newgarden out slow at the front of a restart. There's a big crash behind him. His teammate, Will Power, was knocked out of the race. He wasn't happy with Joseph. Gives him a little salute there on pit road. But in the end, this is New Garden's track. He pulls away for his fifth win in St. Louis. Our Frank Cusimano was in the winner's circle. It's been a really good track to me. Um, you know, half the time we're here, we're, we're pretty fast. We had a super good car again tonight. Uh, the entire team did with Team Penske. So it's fun when you show up to places and you have a good car. Just make sure 
your job a little bit easier. It makes it more fun. It's, Will you have a conversation with Will, your teammate? Well, I, I don't know what to say other than I'm sorry you got hit. You know, it, it's terrible. He got he got run into by someone behind him that mistimed it. And I don't know that I can help that situation. It's terrible that it took him out, but I don't know what I'm going to do different. Chiefs Lions preseason football and Patrick Mahomes looks ready for the regular season. No big deal. Just a behind the back pass to Travis Kelsey for a first down. The dude's just unreal. Great day for St. Louis native and Illinois alum Isaiah Williams. Six catches for 71 yards to lead Detroit. He deserves a roster spot. Lions win on a walk off field goal 24 to 23. Third round of the St. Jude Championship in Memphis. You saw it right here on five on your side. Hideki Masuyama went six under today. He's the leader at 17 under heading into the final round tomorrow. He has a five shot lead on Nick Dunlap in second place. And that will do it for sports. Very good. Thank you, my friend. Gary, what you got? Well, we've got uh, temperatures. You can really see what's settling in. Upper 60s, low 70s. That's what's going to have an influence on driving us into some of this drier, cooler air. That's where we could be off to the southwest overnight, upper 80s, stickiness. We're not involved in that, and that trend will continue as we head into tomorrow. So already starting to see some of that. Uh, you know, we're only four degrees from, from our low this morning right now. So we're in pretty good shape, and I think that's going to be the case here as we head toward tomorrow. Low 80s tomorrow, a steady diet of that, and not much rain to speak of, which is pretty pleasant here overall for us the next couple of days. You know, I like what you said about some days in August could be a lot yeah. hotter than this. We still want the heat. I still want to get sure. to the pool. I haven't been there yeah. enough, but you know. But don't go overboard with it. Yeah. yeah, that's all of our time, my friends. Thanks for the company. Saturday Night Live is next.